Thank you so much for, uh, for having me. And um, so what I'm going to talk about today, it's all, uh, it's all joint work with, um, uh, um, with Vatsal uh, Sharan, um, Annie Marsden, and Aaron Sidford. Um, good. So, so where do I start? Um, good. So I know the topic of this like workshop was sort of uh, computational statistical things, and um, so I'm going to talk about uh, what happens when you have bounded memory, and with limited memory, um, I guess the point is that some computational problems inherently the memory constraint turns them into information theoretic or so statistical problems, and so I wanted to give. Um, a little bit of high-level thoughts on, on kind of uh, optimization with, with bounded memory, and now hopefully I'll talk about two concrete, uh, two concrete uh, uh, things. Um, good. So, so the, broad, the broad sort of theme um, is, well, suppose you want to do some convex optimization um, over some data points, and the question is really how do constraints on the amount of memory you have affect uh, either, say, the amount of data you need to optimize something or, or to do some learning task, um, or, you know, sorry, that's okay. uh, or, you know, or how, how do constraints on the memory affect, say, the number of queries you need to make to some underlying object that you're trying to optimize? Okay. Um, so maybe I'll just write that. Uh, how do uh, memory constraints... impact, I'll say data, or sort of query, uh, amount of data or queries needed to learn or optimize. Good. And, uh, okay, the following might be like a little bit below all of you, but let me, let me do it anyway. Um, so the sort of the, the background picture I have uh, is, you know, if you think about optimization theory, there are sort of their first order methods. In general, you think of first order methods as uh, you know, things like gradient descent. You have some function, you want to optimize it. You just store, store some point in your mind, uh, try to, to somehow come up with some gradient, go downhill. They're very easy to code. It's just two lines of code. Um, computationally, it's pretty nice. Uh, each update is just kind of order dimension time to update. Your memory is really, all you need to do is store your current iterate, so order dimension memory, you know, ignoring log factors. Um, and so, you know, these first order methods tend to be, you know, they're great in practice, they're easy to code. Um, if you think about how quickly they converge, um, they often converge fairly well, but um, if you have ill-conditioned problems, you have this problem of, you know, you kind of, if, you, if you're trying to optimize along some like skinny valley, you spend all your time going up and down the, even with momentum, you spend all your time going up and down the steep valley walls rather than down the bottom of the valley. And this is formalized as generally you have a polynomial dependence on the condition number of your problem. Um, on the other hand, you have these kind of second order methods, um, many of which require more computation per update. Uh, many of them require quadratic inform, uh, memory to store some second, you know, sec you know, to store some Hessian information, some curvature information. Um, but, uh, but, you know, these things, so they're a bit more complicated, memory, more memory intensive. Um, they get faster convergence, and even in ill-conditioned settings, generally you get a logarithmic dependence on the condition number. Um, and, you know, there's, there's like a huge area of optimization theory trying to say, can you get best of both worlds? Are there simple algorithms, ideally using little memory, that get the kind of uh, nice benefits of, kind of these, these second order methods? Um, and, you know, so one natural question is just, can you hope to get these nice benefits of second order methods with using less memory than would be naively required? So with either less than dimension squared memory, can you hope to get these things? With maybe near linear memory, can you still hope to get you know, polynomial condition dependent, sorry, logarithmic dependence on condition number, and so on. Okay, so, so uh, you know, my, if you remember one thing about this talk, I hope it's just, 
you know, maybe memory is a nice, is a nice sort of uh, lens into optimization theory. Um, of course, it's going to be very hard to prove something like, you know, the amount of computation time you need per update needs to be blah, 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 blah. But maybe if you turn it into an information theoretic, a statistical problem, like given small memory, you can't optimize well. Um, maybe then it might be solvable. Good. So um, I'm going to do two sort of different vignettes into this memory as a lens into optimization. Um, one of them is going to be taking like the simplest, most canonical uh, optimization problem, just linear regression, and looking at that through the, men through the lens of limited memory. And then the second part of the talk will be on um, uh, a more general optimization framework. You're trying to minimize some, um, some convex, one Lipschitz function over the unit, unit sphere. Um, so we're going to look at these two, di two different things, right? One specific function that we're trying to optimize, and then this, this bigger sort of uh, framework of optimization problems. Okay, so part one, uh, linear regression. Okay, and then part two, um, we'll be optimizing a convex uh, one Lipschitz function over the unit ball, um, given access to uh, you know, a first order Oracle, uh, na namely you get to submit queries and I'll give you the function value at the queried point and I'll even give you a, a gradient. Okay. Um, so kind of given, I'll just say gradient uh, queries. Okay. Um, Okay, and I was going to say, everything I say should be understandable to everybody who, who wants to understand it. So if you don't understand something and want to, just uh, ask, ask questions. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so this regression problem. Um, yeah, let's, let's just formalize it. Um, okay, so the universe is going to choose some, some vector. Uh, let me say, call it V star. Um, I guess we'll think about two different cases, um, but uh, V star will be a d-dimensional vector. Um, and our goal is going to be to guess V star or to approximate it somehow. So that's the goal. I'm, I'm trying to figure out if I, uh, uh, okay. Uh, okay, so our goal is going to be to learn some you know, V star or approximate it. And what are we given? Well, we're given, we're given data. And our data has the form, we're going to be given um, some vector x1 and its inner product with V star. And you can ask for another data point. I'll give you x2 and its inner product with uh, v star and so on. And I guess we'll think about a few different settings. But um, think of each of the x's is going to be drawn from some, from some nice distribution that you know. Drawn from a nice distribution. Maybe the d-dimensional Gaussian, maybe the d-dimensional uh, unit, unit cube, or the Boolean cube. Um, good. OK. And the goal is to yeah, recover or approximate um, uh, v star with, with relatively little, you know, using as, as few uh, examples as few, a little data as possible. Good. Okay, so maybe the, f the first setting that I wanted to mention, um, so I started thinking about these problems a while ago, I guess it's um, uh, probably eight years ago. Um, 
motivated by the case where you know, V star is some real vector, these inner products are over the reals and so on. And it seemed a little bit hard to think about it, so then we were thinking about this problem over F2, where V star is a Boolean vector and so on. Um, and let me, let me first describe the Boolean setting, and then we'll think about the real setting. Okay, good. So, uh, let me see. So the first setting, yeah, so V star, um, think of it as it's just a length D binary string. Each of our data points, each of the X's, is a random um, length, length D binary string. So each XI is drawn from the uniform distribution over yeah, the 0, 1 to the D. And the last piece is, I guess, these inner products are going to be you know, inner products over F2. So they're, if you have two binary strings, take their inner product and look at that mod 2. Um, uh, mod two. Okay, so, so this is literally, uh, you're trying to solve this linear system over F2. Okay, so, so how do we do it? Uh, um, okay, so yeah, how do you solve a linear system? D-dimensional linear system, mod two. Two words, someone scream them out. Okay, 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 good. So, so Gaussian elimination, right? So like, you know, each of these examples, this is like a length D vector, this is just a, a bit. Uh, and you know you write out this big matrix of all these linear equations, mod two. The fact that's mod two doesn't affect Gaussian elimination, and then you start adding and subtracting them up, and and you uh, and you solve. Yeah, uh, it's been a long time since I've done this, but it's pretty painful. Okay. Um, and you know one reason that's pretty painful is because you actually you know intuitively it feels like you, know, you need to write out this big matrix of examples, right? Like the usual way you think about Gaussian elimination, you literally, you know, so we're gonna need D equations, we have D unknowns, right? the D coordinates of V star, so you need D examples, um, and you need to kind of write out this big matrix and then you start adding and subtracting things. Okay, so, so see this is like our naive algorithm. Well, it'll use memory uh, order D squared. Um, you can shave off, maybe you can do d squared over two, but let, let's just say memory d squared. And then using d examples, like with d examples, there's a decent chance that this thing is full rank. There's a decent chance that it's uh, uh, full rank, and then you can just do this via Gauss Gaussian elimination. Okay. Uh, what if what if you were forced to use much less memory? What if you were forced to use like order D memory? How would you do this? Brute force. Brute force. Okay. So yeah. What do you mean by that? Uh, you subtract yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. So okay. So uh, um, okay. okay. So brute force. Right. So we're going to guess a, po a candidate for V star. Um, that just takes D memory, and then we just check. You know, check whether it checks out for, you know, if it checks out with respect to the next D examples, then we're pretty confident that it's the right answer. As soon as it doesn't check out, let's pick a new V star. Yeah? Okay. So brute force, um, well, the memory is just, I don't know, like D, basically D plus log D or something. We need to be able to count to D and we need to be able to store our guess. Okay, but... Uh, well, let me just say order D. Um, but then, yeah, you know, if we, if we want to be successful, we do need to end up seeing sort of exponential in D uh, examples. Right, because, uh, you know, we can't remember them because our memory is small and we'll need to guess lots of times before we get the right one. Okay. Um, and, okay, so then we had a, we had like kind of a silly paper um, with uh, Stefan Wadger and Jacob Steinhardt 
in 2015. Um, we did some stuff, but the nicest part was this conjecture that this is all you can do. That with memory less than order g squared, um, any algorithm is doomed to need exponential examples. And the conjecture was, uh, like, it wasn't just that. The conjecture was that it actually wouldn't be so hard to prove it. Okay? Um, and then sure enough in, uh, uh, well, no, no, like, uh, okay. Okay, people laugh, but let me explain that in a sec. Um, okay, and then in 2016, uh, there's the theorem of uh, Ron Ross. So, so, so he proved this. So with memory less than, you know, I don't know what the constants are, but less than d squared over, let me put, I don't know, 10. Um, if you have less than d squared over 10 memory, you'll need some, you know, exponential in d uh, examples. So just some constant factor, less memory than you would need to actually do Gaussian elimination. You basically might as well just use the memory and do brute force. Okay. Um, and there have been a number of papers with a few different proofs of this sort of thing. Uh, the 2017 paper of Ross with a much nicer proof than the original one, a moshwitz moshwitz paper that um, has a really nice, quite different sort of proof uh, of basically the same result. And it's been extended in a number of different directions. So what, one thing about the, about the laughing, <laughs> laughing about the, uh, I forget what people laughed about, but, oh, that it would be provable. Okay, so the original motivation for this conjecture, which is now, I guess, a theorem. Uh, um, so one motivation for this was like parity with noise. So parity with noise, uh, say 10% of the time, the inner product mod two, this bit is, is flipped, is wrong. And for parity with noise, um, you know, we don't know any efficient algorithms. The best algorithm is just slightly, the best algorithm we know is slightly sub-exponential. And um, one, like, imagine trying to prove an unconditional hardness result for that. Okay. So again, this sounds like very silly. It sounds like it's gonna be as hard to prove as p versus np, which is probably correct. Um, but how would you prove some unconditional hardness result for parity with noise? Well, here's one approach. First, show that any algorithm, you know, noise, no noise, whatever, any algorithm to solve this thing with or without noise uh, needs lots of memory. You fundamentally need like quadratic memory in order to solve it efficiently. Okay, that's piece one. And piece two is some sort of thing that says, look, take any learning problem where you actually need lots of examples to get information from them. Like you need lots of memory in order to learn. Now add a bit of noise and it should become computationally hard. Does that seem plausible? It doesn't seem so silly, right? The fact that you can't extract information from each example on its own, unless you have lots of them stored in memory together, means something like, you know, there's no like low degree way of pulling out information. And if whatever, any function that computes what you want needs to be high degree, now you add a bit of noise, and poof, everything should uh, become like impossible and get muddied around. Okay, so this is, you know, this is like super naive way of proving some unconditional hardness of parity with noise, which is where this conjecture first sort of came out. Uh, and at the time, I wasn't sure which of these two pieces would be harder. Like memory lower bounds sounded pretty hard. Some of the, some of the cell probe lower bounds, you know, uh, seem al almost as hard as proving p versus np. I wasn't clear whether this, you know, this sort of thing would end up being more like p versus np. Um, but then, you know, for, for some reasons which turned out to pan out, you know, this turns into more of a statistical question. And once you get your problem to look more like an information theoretic problem instead of a computational problem, it becomes doable, right? Like there's p versus np, which is a big black hole, anything close to it becomes very hard to do. Information theory, it's all easy stuff. Just that, just, <laughs> just, yeah, just ask, uh, just ask guy, right? Uh, sorry? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, uh, good. So, any thoughts or questions on that, by the way? I still think one can get some cool result by trying to finish that, that, that piece, but, uh, um, okay. Um, good. 
Okay, the other motivation behind this conjecture was actually wondering about what happens in the real valued case. So let me come back to that. So, okay, so this is the setting uh, over F2. Um, so what happens over the reals? So say we, uh, say V star is, is a unit vector in D dimensions. Um, Say the xi's are picked from, uh, it doesn't really matter, but say an isotropic, an isotropic Gaussian in d dimensions. Um, and the inner product is over the reals. Okay? So it's literally like you know, linear, linear regression uh, over the reals. So what, what does the lay of the land there look like? So uh, you could certainly do Gaussian elimination. Um, So, so there, yeah, Gaussian elimination. Uh, okay, so there you would need like d squared memory. So say the goal is to learn v star to error epsilon, like to angle epsilon. Uh, okay, so now we need memory d squared. I guess if you want to keep track of bits of precision, maybe log one over epsilon bits. And the number of examples uh, is still d. Okay, what if you don't want to use much memory? What do you do? How do you solve a linear, a big linear system over the reals? How do you do it in practice? A really big one. Two words, what? Uh, SDG, yeah, yeah, so uh, let's, uh, yeah, good, good. Uh, okay, so I'll just call it gradient descent, right? Uh, well, fine, SDG. Um, Okay, so we're just gonna you know, store our guess. Every example, we update our guess according to the gradient. Um, we're gonna pick like the right way of doing all of the momentum, blah, blah, blah. This is like the Kazmarsh algorithm or something. Okay, um, okay uh, so what are the properties of this? Right, so over the reals, like gradient descent makes sense, right? Uh, over F2, the fact that this inner product is mod two makes your gradients messed up. But um, okay, so here our memory is Basically, order d. Let me say like d, but maybe log one over epsilon bits of precision. And the number of examples, if you do the best version of gradient descent, uh, it's not bad. It's like d log one over epsilon. Okay, so a super naive question is just like with, uh, you know, something like D memory, or say with subquadratic memory, can you hope to get a convergence rate that's any better than this? Right? Like can, you, can, you get, you know, can you get sort of something like D, you know, with D examples and less memory, can you, can you still do well? Okay. And, and actually, we still, we still don't know. Okay, so this is an open question. With, say, the conjecture with less than d squared memory. The claim is that we might as well only use like d memory and do the best version of gradient descent. And the claim is that we need like d log one over epsilon examples um, with uh, Vatsal and, and Aaron. I guess we had a theorem, which is a bit embarrassing, but. Uh, so the theorem says, yeah, with less than d squared memory, like less than d squared over 100 memory, implies that uh, <laughs> you need at least d, like log, log one over epsilon examples. Okay, so so obviously this is like, you know, uh, it's pretty far from where we want to go, but it's at least non-trivial, right? It at least shows that you know, less than d squared memory, something breaks. Um, and the proof of this uh, is very similar to Ron Ross's 2017 proof, like a uh, slightly newer proof of this result via these branching programs, and maybe I'd say a little bit about that, but I wanted to talk about uh, the part two in a little bit. Um, okay. 
But I think the, yeah, the main reason I wanted to say this is like, in this real valued case, um, you know, we still don't know the answer. There's still a pretty big gap between like our theorem and what the right answer probably is. Um, and you might say, well, like, I don't really care about like log factors, you know, like that, yeah, I don't really care about that. Great. Um, an even better open question in this regime is, suppose the x's are picked from some ill-conditioned Gaussian. So instead of being picked from some isotropic thing, pick it from some ill-conditioned distribution, uh, ill-conditioned Gaussian with some random orientation. Then, you know, if you do Gaussian elimination, you end up with just a logarithmic dependence on the condition number. Um, like you'll need a, like the memory will, need more bits to deal with ill conditioning. Um, basically, you can quickly figure out, uh, you know, a basis of your principal axes of your Gaussian and, and may turn it into the well conditioned case. But the best gradient descent type of algorithm um, will end up with a polynomial dependence on the condition number. And the conjecture there is any algorithm that uses subquadratic memory needs a polynomial dependence on the condition number. So if you don't care about log factors, ignore this, and instead subquadratic implies polynomial dependence on condition number. That, that, that's the conjecture. I think to prove that, one probably needs to at least be able to prove this. So that's one, one reason to start with this. But. Okay, uh, let, me, let me go on to the second part of the talk. Uh, we can come back to these questions, but any thoughts or questions on this? Yeah, that, that's a nice question. Yeah, so this 10 and 100, I just made these up now. Um, I'm not sure what the, <laughs> no, I'm not sure, what <laughs> not sure what the proofs actually are. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, uh, so even in this parity case, um, there are nice open questions. So even beyond optimizing the constant, if you think about parity with noise, so you can take like, I think almost any of the proofs and if you now have some noise, like an epsilon fraction of these bits you flip, um, it's uh, quite easy to show that, yeah, subquadratic memory, maybe now you need, um, uh, sorry, with memory like d squared over epsilon, you need, a, but less than that, you need an uh, exponential number of examples. Um, the right answer should be something like d squared over epsilon squared. And I don't think any of the proofs can be like not, you know, trivially jiggled to get that. So even in the finite field setting, like beyond the constants, there are like these nice questions that make it clear that we don't really understand how to prove these things like the right way maybe. Um, but, uh, but yeah. Um, yeah. Other? So somehow you allow to trace the examples if you want. Mm. Yeah, yeah, so if you can query examples, just query basis vectors. And that tells you the bits of, <laughs> of E star one at a time. So in the query setting, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, um, um, since you mentioned it, um, suppose you're given these data points, like written in some read-only memory, and you have a small bit of working memory. So this is like the cell probe setting. Um, in the, in the F2 setting, um, all you need is like roughly order D bits of working memory, and you can actually solve this thing. Basically, you have some big circuit, blah, blah, blah. You can turn your circuit into some, uh, you just reevaluate the different pieces. And, okay. In the real valued setting, in the cell probe, like the same thing doesn't work because the number of bits of precision gets enormous. And that's, and, but proving that sounds really hard. But it'd be super interesting. But currently, that seems like proving some p vert and p type thing. But, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll go on to the second part of the talk. I have what? Ten minutes? Or? Oh. Oh, nice. Perfect. Okay. 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 Good. Um, we can we can come back to well. Okay. Um,
OK, so the second part of the talk, uh, we're just going to think about um, this kind of canonical uh, optimization framework. So our goal is to, um, okay, we're going to minimize, our goal is to minimize some function. Um, and okay, so our function is going to, the promise is that this is um, convex. Uh, it maps from D dimensions uh, to one dimension, um, and it's uh, one Lipschitz. And suppose our goal is to minimize this over the, the unit, uh, uh, the D dimensional unit, uh, unit ball. So uh, minimizing over X in R to the D such that uh, you know, the norm of X is at most one. Okay, so like the you know the fact that it's one Lipschitz and so on. I mean, this is and the unit ball. These are just to fix the scaling so that we don't need to think about the scalings. Okay. okay so how are we going to do this? Like, what's the optimization problem? How is it formulated? How do we interact with this? Well, you know, think of it as you don't know the function. Instead, you interact with it by sequentially querying points. You give me an x. And I'll tell you the function evaluated at x, and I'll give you a gradient uh, of f at x. Okay, so um, I guess this is known as like a first order oracle. Okay. So iteratively, you give me some query, and I return uh, like f of x, and and uh, I'll give you a a g of x, which is uh, you know, a gradient or subgradient uh, of f uh, at x. Okay, and the the question is, you know, how do you how do you get say with an epsilon of the opt um, using as few queries as possible? Okay. So is it clear that the framework? Like there, are like lots of optimization things work within this sort of paradigm, right? Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. So, uh, so there are two sorts of ways of doing this. Um, okay. So one, so one algorithm is just sort of gradient descent. Okay. So, so gradient descent. Maybe pick a random uh, point on, point in the unit sphere. Um, and then, you know, your update, like your query at time i plus one is just going to be your query at time i, um, you know, updated according to some, you know, some learning parameter eta times the gradient you got at the previous step. Okay. Did I pick the sign here correctly? Probably. Who knows? Okay. Uh, Okay, how good is gradient descent at solving this? Well, uh, it's certainly easy. It's just <laughs> one line of code. Uh, computationally, like in D dimensions, it says order D time, right? Um, in terms of memory, uh, it's just, you know, the, um, let's not worry about bits of precision. It's just order D, you know, uh, memory too, right? So um, I'll say order D time per update. Order D memory. Um, and how many queries do we need to get with an epsilon of the opt? Uh, okay, so so like I, you know, we picked the scaling and the one Lipschitzness so that actually the number of queries is just one over epsilon squared, dimension independent. So this is a okay. So you can do gradient descent. You can also do all of these other. You can also do much fancier things. The fancy algorithms. Um, these are things like ellipsoid, ellipsoid. Uh, so a center of mass type things. Okay, lots of fancy things. Um, uh, 
I, you know, they're, they're, they're hard, you can't write them in one, in one line. And at least all of, all of these ones that sort of I'm aware of, um, the time, like every query, you need to spend like at least quadratic time to figure out your next query. Yeah. Oh, uh, one Lipschitz, oh, yeah. and, and, and no, no, and our, our so we're going to have a lower bound, and our lower bound sort of crucially leverages non-smoothness. And one nice question is like, if things are smooth, uh, what does that do? But yeah, yeah. So, so crucially, it's not not smooth, but it's one Lipschitz. Good question. Okay, okay. So these fancy things. L let me just say like, it takes more than d squared time, like. Per, to figure out your new query per update. Uh, also more than d squared memory. So you know, most of these things, like every query or every, yeah, basically every query, they're kind of solving some linear system to figure out their next query. Um, okay, and, and uh, why, why do people care about these? Well, because the number of queries you need So, so these things, what are they doing? They're trying to, like, they're trying to basically ask a couple of queries in such a way that the region in which the optimum lies is like shrunk by a constant factor. Like, that's their goal. You know, maybe they can't do that for each query. They might need like d queries, but then they get the region to shrink by some constant uh, factor. And so they're basically trying to like turn this into some binary you know, search type of thing. And they'll end up getting, well, they might need to pay a factor of d, but then the dependence on epsilon is like log one over epsilon. Okay. Okay. Good. So the natural, there are lots of natural questions. So one thing is with, uh, so we're going to take the memory uh, viewpoint. So one question with subquadratic memory. You know, can you hope to do any better than our best known linear memory algorithms? Okay, so we don't, we don't know. Uh, with subquadratic memory, um, do you at least need a polynomial dependence on epsilon? Um, from the algorithmic standpoint, it'd be pretty cool if, you know, maybe with memory d to the 1.5, you can get something better than one over epsilon squared. Like maybe, maybe I'm happy to pay some big power of d I just want something better than epsilon squared, like epsilon to the 1.9. To what extent is that doable? Okay. So all of these questions are still open. Um, and let me just, let, let me, uh, um, yeah, let me give our theorem and I'll, I'll tell you very quickly uh, roughly how we prove it. Um, okay, so our theorem, this is with, with uh, yeah, Vatsal, Annie, and, and Aaron. Um, so with memory less than, oh, some embarrassing thing, like d to the one, I don't know, 1.2, 1.25. I'll just say 1.2. Uh, so, okay, there's some epsilon, epsilon being like one over d to the fifth or something, such that with memory less than d to the 1.2, the, um, you need an extra poly d number of queries beyond what you could do with the unbounded memory. So uh, let, let, let me just okay. um, set some epsilon to be 1 over d to the 5. I have no idea what that is. It's probably something like this. Sorry. With memory less than d to the 1.25, you, know, you need to get with an epsilon of the opt, you need more than this number of queries by some polynomial amount indeed. indeed. So you need, I'll say, more than uh, d to the 1 point, I don't know, 01 queries. Okay. It's actually, it's not this bad. It's kind of uh, for any delta, like with memory less than 1.25 minus delta, you need at least 1 plus delta queries. Okay, d to the 1 plus delta um, queries. Okay, so at least shows uh, something along the lines of what you would hope for. Okay. So let me quickly sketch uh, how to prove this. Any questions on what this is saying? Right, so this is like for some specific epsilon regime, we're showing that, yeah, yeah, you can't achieve this. 
unless you have quite a bit of memory. Okay, I'm going to try to do this whole thing without erasing anything. So, <laughs> okay, so um, one of the nice things about this problem formulation, this minimizing some convex function, is that we get to come up with the function f that's going to be hard to optimize. Okay, so we get, to, as opposed to the uh, regression setting where like the function is given, we get to think hard and come up with a function that's hard. So we're going to come up with a hard instance, a hard function f, um, and then we're going to try to argue that this optimization problem, we're going to try to reduce it to some like communication game, which is just going to be an information theoretic thing that someone uh, who, you know, who knows the game would just look at and say, yeah, yeah, it's easy to prove that you need lots of communication. Okay, so good. So let me describe our hard instance. Okay, so our instance, our function will be parameterized by two pieces. Let me call it H and A. And it's going to be a... Um, it's going to be the maximum of two different convex one Lipschitz functions, and like the maximum of convex functions is maximum, blah, blah, blah. Like, so there are two parts. OK, so the first part um, is, is basically just going to be, well, so what is A? So A is going to be a big random matrix. So I'll say this is a random like plus minus one matrix or matrix of size uh, like D over two by D. And we're going to maximize like the, you know, the infinity norm of this. Okay, so find the row that has largest inner product. Okay, and then there's going to be some second piece here. Okay, and maybe we, maybe we you know multiply this by some constant. Maybe we subtract some other constant here. Okay, what's going on? So we have two pieces to to optimize this function to minimize it. We're going to need to know a lot about this function h. The whole point of this function here is that the only way we get like the only way to get information about h is if we query something that is going to basically need to be almost orthogonal to all of the rows of A. If our query X has a significant inner product with one of the rows of A, then our gradient is just going to you know, tell us, oh, hey, you know, <laughs> is this going to tell us about that row of A? So to get any information about H, we're going to need to query something close to orthogonal to all the rows of A. OK, but what is A? A is a big random matrix with like order d squared entries. And, you know, because it's a random plus minus one d squared size thing, like there's no way of compressing it. And the point is that if you want to know about h, we'll pick h such that you need to make quite a few queries that are all a bit different. They're robustly linearly independent. And they're all basically in the null space of A. But you don't even have enough memory to to uh, remember A. So intuitively, like, <laughs> you need to like, relearn A every time you want to learn anything about H. Okay? So that's going to be the idea. So yeah, I can tell you what H is. We call it this kind of Nimorovsky type function. Uh, which, which has been previously used in like a paper of uh, Seb Bubeck and, 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 and his collaborators and so on. Um, basically, I mean, okay, I'll just tell you what it is and it either makes sense or it doesn't. Um, so each of x is going to be the, we're going to pick a bunch of random vectors, v1 through v sub m. These are random, uh, random vectors. And this h of x is just the max over i of like the inner product between your query and vi minus some offset, minus like i times roughly 1 over root dim dimension. 
So, so what does this do? Like, you kind of, because of this i times this thing, like, you kind of need to learn a bunch of these vectors v. You kind of need to step through them one at a time. You need to make them all happy if you want to optimize this function, which means you're going to need kind of m vectors that are all sort of linearly independent that are all in the null space of A. You kind of need to figure out something about all these Vs if you want a good chance of minimizing the function. All, to get any information about any of them, you need to query something in the null space of A. Okay, so uh, this is a hard instance. Let me just sketch. So we're gonna show that you know, optimizing this means you can solve this much simpler information theoretic game. So let me just describe that game and then we can, uh, and then we can all go home. Sounds good? Whoever keeps track of the time. Um, please, yeah. Oh, good, good, sorry, so you're saying, uh, I mean, I don't, not, like, I mean, sort of, but maybe it's not direct. Let, let me just, let me mention this communication game, which I think is a piece that doesn't appear in that sort of thing. Uh, yeah. Okay, so the communication game is, uh, is gonna be real. Uh, okay, so your goal, um, is to return k vectors y1 through y sub k and they need to be like robustly linearly independent in that like the inner product between any two of them um, so they're all going to be unit vectors the inner product between them needs to be at least like one over some poly in d so they don't need to be like super different they just can't all be the same right? uh, so return k vectors that are like, I'll say linearly independent. And then, you know, they should all be very close to the null space of A. Okay, they should be close to, you know, some inverse poly, close to um, uh, having, you know, zero inner product with all the rows of A. So I'll say approximately in null space of A. So that's, the, that's gonna be your goal. What's the setup? So the setup is first, I show you A. Okay, you see A, and you get to compress it into you know, some message of size M. Okay, you see A, you compress to a message, which is some function of A, um, and say this is capital M bits. Okay, so you've compressed A, now A disappears, and all you have is your message. So using, using message, now you can adaptively ask me to tell you the rows of A. You could say, okay, I have my message. Uh, okay, tell me the third row of A. And I tell you the third row of A. Um, so adaptively query rows of A. Okay, so you, know, you have the message. Think of your message as, as written down for you somewhere. And then you say, okay, can I have row three? and I give you like the third row of A. I say, okay, give me the 12th row of A. Uh, okay, okay, now you think hard, say, oh, okay, now give me this other row and so on. And um, all of the queries and the, the rows you get to see, they stay there forever. They're written on the blackboard for you along with your message. And you get to query, say, Q rows. Of A. And then after that, as some arbitrary function of your compressed version of A, of your message, and all of these things, you need to come up with this list of, of vectors. Okay? Okay, so the question is like, as a function of the number of bits 
and the number of queries, how many of these vectors can you come up with? Okay, is it clear what this game is? You see A, you compress it however you want into M bits. Using your compressed version, you can now say, okay, can you remind me these different rows? And then at some point you say, okay, here's a bunch of vectors, all pretty orthogonal to rows of A, and they're not the same vector. They're robustly linearly independent. Okay, so here's a, here's a pop quiz, and we're basically, basically done. Uh, okay, so pop quiz, say, um, okay, so A is gonna be like this random D over two by D plus minus one matrix. Okay, suppose your memory M is like D squared over two. How many queries do you need to ask to like output, I don't know, order D of these vectors? Zero, why? Yeah, okay, good. Okay, so if your memory is D, D squared over two, you just remember A, and then, you know, if even with no queries, you've remembered A, then we can output, say, K is like uh, root D. Sorry, we can output K is like uh, D over two. You know, we, know that we know everything. We can output the things, the, a basis for the null space, and we're done. Okay. Okay, good, that's one thing. Uh, say your memory zero, and we still want to output, say, D over two queries. Uh, if, if, if our memory is zero and we want to output, I don't know, order D queries, how many, sorry, order, order D vectors. I don't know. How many queries do you think we need to make? Yeah, okay, well, yeah, certainly with like, okay, if we, certainly if we query D over two rows, well, okay, now we know all of A and we're done. Okay, so now, now the hard question for Kosis. Okay, suppose our memory is something like root D, and how many queries are we gonna want? Uh, and Q, the number of queries is also root D. What can we do? The answer is kind of nothing. So, so the point is, is really that like, like for any reasonable value of k, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, sure, 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 sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Good. Um, uh, okay. Here, let, let, let me tell you the theorem. So basically, you kind of can't do anything between these two. So if uh, if M is less than, say, 0 0.1 times K times D, right? So, so like, you know, you have some constant factor less memory than you just need to be done. Like, like if you had KD memory, you just store your K answers, okay? Constant factor, factor less, then the claim is you actually need, like, order D queries to get your K vectors, okay? Yeah, yeah, okay, so this is, the lemma, the lemma, given like constant factor less memory than you would need to just not ask any queries, you actually do need to ask like 0.1D queries to get uh, K vectors. Okay. Right, so basically these two things are kind of all you can do, right? Like uh, either you have enough memory to like not ask any queries, <laughs> Given a little bit less than that memory, you just need to ask like order D queries. Okay, and these constants I just made up now. Uh, okay, good. And th what's the connection between this game and the optimization problem? Well, I don't want to do the like formal reduction now, 
But suppose you have some algorithm that does optimize this function um, using surprisingly little memory. Well, to optimize this function, it asks a bunch of queries that are all different, that are all different, that give you information about H. So all of those queries that it asks that give you information about H must be pretty close to the null space. And this sort of corresponds to, uh, you know, to this, Plausibly, you can map it to this sort of game, right? Okay. Uh, good. So this is the key. This is the key lemma. Proving this is pretty easy, right? Like you have a big random matrix. You want to like know something about the null space. You can't really compress much about it. You know, it's it's not so hard to prove this sort of thing. Um, and even you know, and doing the reduction is also not that hard. Um, I was going to say, make maybe conceptually the only hard part is. Uh, figuring out the right way to turn your optimization problem into a clean information theoretic sort of, sort of game. Okay, so this is all I was gonna say about that proof. Let me just, let me end with a few things. So, um, uh, good, so did I write our theorem anywhere? No, it's probably better that I didn't. Um, so, uh, oh good, okay. Okay, good. Okay, so, so in terms of open questions, um, good. So this lower bound works for randomized algorithms and all that stuff. Obviously, our like exponent of this d to the 1.25 should be d squared. Um, there might or might not be a public paper that, that does that. Uh, there is a public paper that does it in the deter for deterministic algorithms um, uh, from MIT folks, um, which follows sort of roughly this framework um, yeah, so improving our bound to d squared memory uh, isn't something that you guys should spend your time doing. Um, I think other people have already solved that. Um, but these bigger questions of like, with subquadratic memory, you know, are you doomed to get one over epsilon squared convergence? Um, how much memory do you need to get like subpolynomial in epsilon? Are there, is there any middle ground like, can you, can you pay a big factor of D and save on the factor of epsilon with less than quadratic memory? Like, all of these questions are still completely open. Um, and just to conclude, one of the nice things, one of the things I like about these kind of memory-bounded learning optimization things is that there are lots of different proof techniques that seem to all be um, fairly different. So in this optimization setting, you know, it was kind of this communication game. That was one thing. In the Ron Ra style proof of the regression setting, it's analyzing branching programs. There's no, like there's no entropy anywhere in the proof. The word entropy doesn't appear, even though you could sort of squint and see it. Um, but that's analyzing branching programs. Um, and you know, there, there are sort of these different, different proofs for different things, and we really don't understand the lay of the land. Um, so I think it's a, fun, it's a fun area to work in, and I'd love to chat with anyone. Thanks.